feel like there's something you should be doing that you aren't, that you are ignoring a calling, maybe that there is some sort of goal or even a mission that you should be on. The perfect time for episode 22 of Pop Art, the podcast where my guest chooses a movie from popular culture and also look to film from the more art classic side of cinema with a connection to it. I am your We're on a Mission from God host, Howard Kasner. For my listeners, please like, follow, or comment. I'm especially looking for more reviews on iTunes, and I'd love to know what you think. Today, my guests are fellow podcasters Anna Kaiser and Derek Danke, who have chosen the Dan Aykroyd, John Belushi musical extravaganza, The Blues Brothers, while I have chosen the austere 1971 Japanese masterpiece by Masahiro Shinoda, Silence, both with stories about characters who are on a mission from God. To begin, Anna and Derek, why don't you tell us something about yourselves? First of all, Howard, thank you so much for having us on the show. Yeah, We're thank you. really excited to be here. We're also podcasters, so we share that love. Beyond just that, we also do a podcast about films, but we keep it centered on 80s films, hence 80s movie montage. For a time, it was centered not just on 80s movies, 80s movies that had some kind of a fun montage. And <laughs> we didn't want to limit ourselves. We just wanted to have fun with as many 80s movies as we could. Good. So the montage part of it's a little loose it's a at soft, this point. <laughs> soft montage. Oh, what yeah. 80s film is complete without a montage? With that, let's get to your selection, The Blues Brothers. First, some information about the film. The Blues Brothers was released in 1980. It was directed by John Landis and written by Dan Aykroyd and John Landis, based on characters created for Saturday Night Live. It stars, and don't hold your breath because there are a lot of stars here, John Belushi, Dan Aykroyd, James Brown, Cab Calloway, Ray Charles, Aretha Franklin, and Carrie Fisher, Henry Gibson, John Candy, John Lee Hooker, Kathleen Freeman, Steve Lawrence, and as the band, Steve the Colonel Cropper, Donald Duck Dunn, Murphy Dunn, Willie Too Big Hall, Tom Bones Malone, Blue Lou Marini, Matt Guitar Murphy, and Mr. Fabulous Alan Rubin. The basic premise revolves around Jake and Elwood Blues, two blood brothers who had a blues band until Jake ended up in Joliet Prison. Newly released, Jake with Elwood visit the mother superior of the orphanage they grew up in, only to find it about to be sold by the diocese for tax purposes. After an epiphany at a local church, Jake and Elwood decide to reunite the band to raise money to save the orphanage. But along the way, they make enemies of the police, Nazis, and rednecks, while a mysterious woman keeps trying to kill them. So why did you choose this film? This is one of my favorite films of all time. When I've told people that, I am sometimes met with different reactions. I really love the music. I love just how silly it can be. I just have fond memories of seeing this when I was probably too young to actually see this. I love the setting, that it's such a big part of Chicago, even though I'm not from Chicago, and it is, but I love that city. It's got a lot of things that I really enjoy in a movie, which is this quirky humor, great music, that's some of the reasons why I picked it. For me, Derek just mentioned that I'm originally from Chicago. Why I also love this movie so much, it's one of those films that I just identify so much with my home, even with my family. My dad was a huge fan of this film. I love the characters. We could have a whole other conversation about the success of SNL characters going from the show to their own films. I think this is one of the most successful instances of that. Just to interject there, it is the second most successful. It comes between Wayne's World and Wayne's World 2. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> That makes a lot of sense that I totally can get because those are also great characters. I love the chemistry between Aykroyd and Belushi. And I know that they were really great friends off camera. I think that probably contributes to what they have on camera. I love the musical interludes. It's really awesome to see so many musical slash blues slash Motown greats in this film. So I love that part of it as well. When did you first see it? It came out in 1980. I probably wasn't even 10 years old when I saw it. I probably didn't understand a lot of what I was watching, but there were a lot of car chases, crazy things happening. I remember first seeing it when I was a kid, but I remember introducing it to my best friend who had never seen it, my buddy Jason, and I watched it on VHS at his place. That was one of the best parts about watching it, experiencing it with him. And some of the things that happened in the movie are so unexpected. It was hilarious. 
And for me, same as Derek, I definitely was a child. I was too young to have ever seen it in a theater. So I know that it was seen at home. It's possible that it was something that was just being shown on television or we could have had a cassette tape of it. I definitely remember seeing it with my father and the memories of it that really stand out to me because the first time I saw this, I wasn't probably really following this actual story of what they were trying to accomplish. What really stands out to me are I remember the car chases because so many cars got beat up. So and, many cars. Yes, yeah, so many cars. And also the musical numbers. I remember the music. I remember the dancing. Those are the things that first really stood out to me as a kid seeing this film for the first time. What did you think of it upon seeing it again? I've watched it so many times. I was reciting the dialogue before it actually happened. And I can affirm yeah. that that was the case. <laughs> At a certain point, I had to look over. Maybe I've seen this too many times. <laughs> I still really enjoy it. If there's one part that made me sadder than I would have expected, I'll go down this road, I guess. The Illinois Nazis right now now made me think there probably mm -hmm. are actual Illinois Nazis. It probably wouldn't look too dissimilar from that, including a car driving through people. That whole scene, I thought, oh, wow, I would have never thought that a scene like this could actually play out under any circumstances. I used to just laugh at what a bunch of cartoonish villains they were, not realizing that some iteration of that would actually return to the U.S. And so speak to that really quick. There were Illinois Nazis at the time. You might be too young to remember, and I don't know if you heard it a bit since, but the Nazis were going to march in Skokie mm -hmm. in the 1980s. And they even went to court and the court had to side with them. Yes, you can march in Skokie. It's your constitutional right. They did eventually decide not to. And this is one of the things that inspired that. And mm -hmm. I also do agree when I saw it this time, and it's Jake and Elwood who are driving through the crowd, whereas yeah. today it's the Nazis who would be right. driving through the crowd. Exactly. That did strike me as, oh, that's an interesting cultural historical thing there. Yeah. <laughs> Same for me, seeing it the most recent time. We're 40 years on from when this film came out. Honestly, there was a part of me while I was watching the film thinking like, I wish I could talk to the filmmakers, to Landis and Aykroyd, get their perspective on whether or not they ever thought that something that they were putting in the film as a joke would have such a cultural impact today, that this would be something that wasn't really funny. And I don't think it takes anything away from the film. It was kind of a hard swallow when I was watching it to be like, oh, wow, this is something that's actually very much in our country right now. It was just a joke, total joke when it was first put in that film. You would never think that we would go backwards right. to such mm -hmm. a degree so that 40 years later- It's it, not yeah. a joke anymore. Right. As Oscar Wilde said, it's life imitating art. From the outset, Jake and Elwood are our protagonists. We want them to succeed in their mission from God. They do. They're largely untouched by what happens. And it's very, very clear that besides the Nazis, obviously law enforcement is kind of the bad guy. Again, kind of a interesting layer that was present watching it this last time that never really resonated with me per se, seeing it as a kid. So those things were really interesting as more of a positive takeaway from the most recent screen going on about what I was saying a little bit earlier. I think I had even more appreciation for some of the individuals that I saw, Ray Charles and Cap Calloway, these greats who are no longer with us. I miss that kind of talent, seeing that kind of greatness, Rita Franklin, of course. And then also I love both of the leads that even though they both have somewhat subdued performances, Jake Belushi, there's this overlap between who we knew him to be off screen and who he was on screen. He has a little bit more of the outrageous character, which made me appreciate Aykroyd that much more because he's absolutely the straight man throughout. Until they start dancing. Until they start dancing. Then anything goes. Aykroyd just running in place as, as furiously as he can. <laughs> I love it. Speaking of that, one of the problems they had in making the film and one of the reasons why it did go for budget, John Belushi she was pretty much on cocaine the mm -hmm. whole time. It was he, on the budget, right? I think they also snuck it in on the budget. A lot of that <laughs> on the budget. Dan Aykroyd was also using cocaine. They said everybody was, but nobody was using it the way John Belushi was. I first saw it, as I often say on this podcast, when it first came out. I was living in Chicago, and that made it a lot more exciting for people living in Chicago to see. We thought it takes place in Chicago. It's very Chicago-centric, the blues with Chicago. There was a certain added excitement that we brought with us when we were going to watch it, and we thought it was a lot of fun, and it is. It is a lot of fun, and it can be very fun if you live in Chicago and you know Chicago, and I'm watching it this time, and I say, oh, that looks familiar, or I 
remember that kind of block. I wouldn't necessarily be able to recognize the specific location. So sometimes it's going, I think I know that street, but it was very nostalgic yeah. to see it this time around. And sometimes it does get very funny because when they're being chased on lower level Wacker mm -hmm. and they say something like, we're 10 or 15 minutes from the Daily Center. And then suddenly they're at McCormick Place yeah. on the <laughs> south side. And I went, where did you make a turn to get totally outside of the loop? And that's always a lot of fun. If you ever see a movie that's filmed in your city, it's always fun to see where they take liberties. If you've ever seen My Best Friend's Wedding, yep. where they're leaving the airport and in less than five minutes, they're on Lakeshore Drive. Right. And I'm going, I, I don't think that's how it works. I remember as a child, there's a town in the northern suburbs outside of Chicago called Wakanda. My father used to take us there. There's a lake, slides that you can go into the water. And I was like, wait a minute, because there's a scene in the film where I think that might be Wakanda. And it sure enough was. What are some of your favorite scenes? I like most of the musical numbers, although to be honest, the Ray Charles one isn't my favorite. I do really enjoy all the music they play at the end when they're in mm -hmm. Palace Hotel and Ballroom. If I was going to say there's one scene that for me just epitomizes this movie, it's when Jake and Elwood are flying on the freeway at high speed, suddenly reach what appears to be a construction zone and end of the freeway, resulting in Elwood using both feet on the brakes, no anti tie-lock brakes on this cop car, so it just skids to a stop. He quickly shifts into reverse. The car then proceeds to do a massive backflip in the air, twists back around, and they drive off to safety while the Nazis fly off the freeway to what appears to be an elevation of 10,000 feet before dropping down <laughs> moments before Jake and Elwood then fly over the crater they made. There's so much bonkers stuff that happens in that couple of minutes. It really represents this movie. It's my favorite scene because when I saw it i don't know what's happening anymore <laughs> <laughs> For me, I have two favorite scenes. The first is actually the opening of the film because it does a perfectly executed job of setting up the characters. You don't even see their faces. You know who they are just by seeing the back and forth between Elwood coming to get Jake and then Jake getting his belongings as he's getting out of prison. Also, just from a more sentimental place, I, again, really love the concert scene, especially when they're singing Everybody Needs Somebody to Love. That's just always been a favorite song. I don't know if we've mentioned that Derek and I were actually a married couple and that was our final song at our wedding. Oh, wow. Yeah, it has like a little bit of sentimental value for me. So that's kind of mine too. Although prior to them singing Everybody Needs Somebody to Love, I really love the Cab Calloway number. You need a yeah, it's beautiful. I love the way that they magically are all in tuxes and have this really grandiose background. It's really, really well done. And he is obviously this great performer. My favorite scene, and in a way this shows what I think also doesn't quite work about the movie. And I do have to be honest and say, as much as I enjoy the Blues Brothers. I do think it falls short, and there are reasons for that. But for me, the highlight is Aretha Franklin mm -hmm. with the Think number. She belts it out there. She's like, I am Aretha Franklin, and you're all going to know it. <laughs> I do have to quote Pauline Kell here, who summed it up perfectly. She said, it has taken all these years for Aretha Franklin to reach the screen, and then she's on for only one number. Getting her into the Blues Brothers was the smartest thing that the director John Landis did. Letting her get away after that number was the dumbest. This is the best photographed music number in the movie. This is one of the places where, to a certain degree, I think the movie falls short. This is a great scene. She is great. She just takes over. She commands it. And it takes place in such a small location. And the choreography is very, very minimal. And it has really nice things like when Jake and Elle would join the chorus of yeah. the three yeah. women. But then you compare it to the other two major numbers that are choreographed. And that's the scene in the church where Jake and Elle would have the epiphany. And then the number outside Ray Charles's pawn shop. I'm going, you're not getting it, Landis. You're falling short. And the reason is, and this is something that started happening in movies since around the time when hair was made. How I describe it is that the choreography in a movie stopped being done by the choreographer and started being done by the editor. Huh. Okay. You constantly have dance moves interrupted, dance moves that don't build to a climax because they're constantly edited away from. You don't get to see the whole dancer or dance when you should. The scene in the church should have been mind-numbingly transcendental, but Landis can't quite pull it off. It just doesn't come together the way it would if, say, Gene Kelly or Stanley Donnan or one of the great choreographers during the 50s had filmed it. And it's the same for the one outside of the pawn shop. 
So whenever there's no choreography, whenever there's no dance, the music numbers come off incredibly well and the singing is great. So yes, the scenes at the Palace Hotel, they're wonderful. Also, the action scenes could have been better edited. I enjoy the scene at the mall where they're just destroying everything. Yeah. <laughs> but I do wish it had been a bit better edited and built. But other than that, I think the camera work is actually very nice. The framing of the camera and the framing of the scenes often are very striking. John Landis has a very good eye. There was a scene that we both cracked up at when they're first pulled over by the police for running a red light. The way that it's framed where you just see Elwood about to shift back into drive and take off through the, like the back of the car. You see the police officers running mm -hmm. off to get to their car to chase it. There are some moments where the way that it was put together was really striking. And I guess to your point about the music numbers, you're right. The palace is in some ways the most straightforward because at that point, it's more in line with just filming a concert. It's not really telling a story in the way that the other numbers were, especially the Aretha Franklin number was in some ways the most personal of them because it was really about her relationship with Matt Guitar Murphy. It's really interesting what you said about the church scene, because as I was watching it, I was just letting it wash over me. So I wasn't really putting two and two together, but I do remember remember I was trying to follow the choreography of everybody in the church dancing <laughs> and you're right I remember having these multiple moments of disappointment because I couldn't watch them finishing a leap or a dance move or whatever and I wanted to see it play through and I think you're right I think I don't know this is just my assumption that what was happening is instead of trusting what was shot allowing it to play out a little bit more they just were doing these really rapid cuts to emphasize more the energy of the moment that's typically what fast cuts do. But you're right, I think that that was a misstep. No pun intended. As you were talking about those instances, I didn't remember who was the editor on this, and so I took a look. I know he has a long career, George Folsey Jr. It seems like he has a relationship with Landis because he did Animal House, and then he went on to do Coming to America, but this seems to be, at least in his earlier work, one of the few instances where there's a lot of musical numbers, so I feel like perhaps, although there was maybe a relationship there between him and Landis, and that's why Landis brought him on board, he maybe at that point in time didn't really have the wherewithal to know how to cut those types of sequences. Yeah. You're making a very good point there. During the heyday of musicals, the direction and the choreography were done by people who were choreographers. You had Gene Kelly, you had Stanley Donnan, Fred Astaire, who often had a great deal of control over the dance numbers and would completely plan it all out. MGM had a section where they did nothing but musicals. And then you get Jerome Robbins, who did West Side Story and Bob Fosse, who does cabaret, but then you get to people who don't have any experience in musicals. I would have been okay if there had been some more footage of James Brown dancing. Yeah. We get one good slide from one side of the church to the other, mm -hmm. but not enough. The other interesting aspect of it that I think has now changed. Today, we would call this a movie that is basically the appropriation of Black culture by white mm. characters. Mm -hmm. This really isn't about the blues. It's about the blues as interpreted and seen through the eyes of two white characters. At the time, I don't think we really thought so much of it that way. John Belushi and Dan Aykroyd were huge stars. They can get a movie made, they got the movie made. The other positive thing about it, rhythm and blues were on the outs. Disco was big, the blues were just struggling. And you have this movie come out, and yes, it's seen through the eyes of the white characters, but it saved all of these singers, all of these artists, because blues became incredibly popular again. They had the soundtrack for the movie, but then they also had a Blues Brothers album called Briefcase right. Full of Blues that I think in the intro or one of the tracks talks about how, at the time, so much music now is pre programmed electronic disco. Part of what they presented it as was they were trying to preserve this music. And that's interesting what you were saying because not quite being aware of what the circumstances were around that type of music at that time in history, looking at it in retrospect as an adult and seeing these figures that now come across iconic, it's like hard to believe that there was a moment in time where that wasn't the case. That's fascinating. I do wonder if they could actually make this movie today. They tried 20 years ago. <laughs> yeah. Right. That was about 10 years before the culture had an incredibly abrupt change with mm -hmm. the rise of cultural appropriation and mm -hmm. the rise of the Me Too movement. Could you make a movie about the blues with two white leads? My instinct is no for a lot of the reasons that you've already brought up. That's something that somewhat jokingly, but also somewhat seriously comes up a lot when Derek and I are talking about films from this era, because there's just a lot that takes place in films 
films from the 80s that for many, many reasons are now problematic. I mean, many reasons, but all those many reasons are often the same reasons. Yeah, it comes down to (laughs) racism, sexism. I just don't think that it would be possible. But attitudes do change. At the time this was made, this would never have been thought of just cultural appropriation. But at the time, this was a celebration of this music and these great singers. You touched on like an aspect of this that we discussed when we're talking about some of these movies from the 80s. Now we see them through the different lens. There are things that are more problematic now. And I agree with what you just said. At the time this movie was made, it was intended to be a celebration of this music and these characters. Probably no one even thought twice about any issues regarding cultural appropriation. Another question to lay on top of that would be not only would it be made or could it be made now, but is that better or worse in the end if this movie hadn't been made? If it hadn't been made in the 80s and it wouldn't be made now. I think we're better off for having this movie from the 80s and accepting it with its faults that we might see now that we wouldn't have seen then. I think the Blues Brothers could be. (laughs) It would just look very different. The sense that I get when I'm watching the Blues Brothers is that there's great reverence for all of these musical greats. They're all given a chance to show their greatness through singing, through dancing. It wouldn't be much of a movie if it wasn't for all of these performances because to be quite honest, yes, there's plot going on, but it could have been wrapped (laughs) up a lot more quickly. We didn't have all these musical interludes. That being said, 40 years down the road, I feel like it would come across condescending. It would absolutely come across as appropriation to have two white males as the leads. So a film that came to mind while we were talking about this was Green Book. There's a little bit of that, or you know, some people may say a lot of that. The Green Book, the most edgy film about race relations of 1973. Exactly. That's a film that's what, about two, three years old at this point? They don't really get to be off the hook, per say for, well, it was the 80s. I just realized we hadn't even asked the question whether or not the country Western crowd would be upset at the appropriation of their music. (laughs) (laughs) There's also one gay joke that I don't think would ever fly today. And that's when the new Nazis, Henry Gibson and the other person are going down in the car and the other Nazi turns to him and says, I love you. The old stereotype of Nazis are Nazis because they can't admit they're really gay. That's the big joke. I didn't remember that. And that did strike me. But at the time, I probably laughed at that, even though I was out. The film critic and scholar Vito Russo, who's no longer with us, who was talking about boys in the band and said that when he saw boys in the band and Jimmy Carter was president, he found it very funny. When Ronald Reagan was president, he wasn't sure he found it as funny. It's easier to laugh at that during liberal times, and I will laugh at it too. Under Trump, I'm not sure I find it so funny. I don't find much funny. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, much under Trump. I will say that for all the things that we've been discussing, reasons why this movie could or couldn't be made nowadays. And again, it's one of those things where I'm kind of on the fence. I don't know because I do think it's done successfully in the film is Carrie Fisher's character and her being this jolted bride. And she tries to kill him and then he blinks his eyes at her and she goes limp. At the time, I sort of laughed, but my reaction was John Belushi. Right. (laughs) (laughs) And in real life, she was actually dating Dan Aykroyd. So strange how those things cross. But yeah, he does that signature eyebrow raise with her too. He does it time and time again in Animal House. I don't know. I don't think John Belushi giving me the eye would. (laughs) I mean, he's got a lot of charisma. But But not that kind of charisma, which I think was part of the joke, but I'm not quite sure works anymore. It's hard for me to say if that aspect of the film where you just have this very angry, violent, bitter woman coming after him, if that would work as a subplot in today's cinema. She does a great job. I do think it works for the film in that era, but I don't know. With that, here's some more information about the movie. It cost $30 million to make, but it made $115.2 million. It probably should have made more, but there probably is a reason why it didn't. And I'm going to quote an article from Vanity Fair. One day after the editing was done, Wasserman, one of the producers, invited Landis up to his office to speak with Ted Mann, head of the Mann Theaters chain, which dominated film exhibition in the western United States. He told Landis that he would not book the film at any theaters in predominantly white neighborhoods such as West Not only did Mann not want black patrons going there to see the film, he surmised that white viewers were unlikely to see a film featuring older black musical stars. So ultimately, the Bruce Brothers got less than half the bookings nationwide for its initial release than a typical big budget studio film of the era, which did not bode well for its success at the box office, though it still did incredibly well. The film held the record, as you mentioned earlier, for most cars destroyed in the course of a production. (laughs) at 103. 
it was one less than was wrecked in the Blues Brothers 2000 in 1998. Held this record for 18 years until G.I. Joe, The Rise of Cobra in 2009 destroyed 112 cars. There are some interesting cameos. Twiggy is the chic lady who flirts with Elwood in the gas station. Frank Oz in the opening is the corrections officer. Steven Spielberg at the end is the Cook County assessor. If you blink, you're missing that there is Paul Rubens as a waiter when they go to the fancy mm -hmm. restaurant. Chucka Khan is a choir soloist, and John Landis himself appears as a police officer in the patrol car chase. Yeah, this movie had pretty much everybody. With that, let's get to my selection, and that is sure. Silence. Silence was released in 1971. I should say here that my Japanese is not existent, so I'll quite possibly be mispronouncing a number of these names. It's directed by Masahiro Shinoda, written by Shinoda and Shuzaku Indo, based on the novel of the same name by Indo. It stars David Lansom, Don Kenny, Setsuro Tamba, Mako Iwamatsu, Roko Tora, Iaiji Okada, Yoshi Kato, Naboro Matsuhashi, Shima Awashita, and Yuzuki Takito. The story begins in the 17th century when the Catholic Church is losing influence and power due to the Protestant Reformation. To keep power, the church has been trying to convert the Japanese. But the Japanese government, seeing the rising influence of Catholicism, has outlawed it and brutally persecutes any followers. An almost mythic priest who went to Japan and responsible for much of the early success of converting the people there has disappeared and may have recanted. So two Portuguese priests smuggled themselves into Japan to see if they can find him. I actually thought it was really great pairing. At the very, very basic level, it's absolutely clear that in both films, the individuals both believe that they are truly on a mission from God. Obviously, one is this very broad comedy that we just talked about, and the other is the Blues Brothers. Is <laughs> 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 is a foreign film so it comes with its own cultural influence i think you use the word austere also one thing that i thought was really interesting is even though it was made in 71 to me it feels like a little bit of an older film at the very least it does feel like it's very much a removed era from the blues brothers so it has these differences to it obviously tonally visually genre wise but the central story is actually really similar yeah no i would agree you get two pairs that both feel as though they're on a mission from god both sets of characters throughout the course of the films act and behave as though they are insulated mm -hmm. or protected from any harm that could come to them by way of that faith, either their faith in the church in the case of silence or their faith in God or just in the band for the Blues Brothers. But yeah, I thought it was a very interesting pairing. Yeah. When did you first see the film? Just this week. Yeah. <laughs> I get um, that a lot. <laughs> but I love that. That's something that I thought was really neat because obviously new releases, people are going to see it for the first time. But getting to be acquainted with a film that's been around for 50 years at this point that I've never seen, especially something that's an international film, a foreign film, unless you are an individual that goes out of their way because you have an affinity for a certain country cinema or just international cinema, you don't get too many chances. Although, of course, sky's the limit now with what's available to you. It was really a pleasure to get to watch. It. And what did you think of it when you first saw it? You spoke of that some, but what was your impression of it? By the time the movie was over, what I respected about it, and this is possibly because it is a film out of Japan, mm -hmm. I'm fine with subtitles and I would rather watch actors speaking in their native tongue and mm -hmm. just get subtitles and follow along just because of how that affects the performance overall. I like that. And I also, my interpretation was actually a fairly balanced interpretation of this conflict between the Catholic Church and these priests and Japan and the action that they were trying to take to, in some ways, retain their cultural identity, mm -hmm. keep this foreign influence out. And I thought that it was done in a way that didn't portray the Japanese as evil, didn't necessarily portray the Catholic Church as evil. They just didn't want them there. And they were willing to do, you could say, evil things to, from their perception, protect their country, their nation, their people. And I completely agree. Of course, there's no condoning of torture or violence against anybody. That being said, I I also think that it could be for various reasons. It could be because that was the POV of the novel that it was based off of, or just the fact that, yes, it was a Japanese production. But I actually really 
appreciated that there was this very balanced take and that the people of Japan were portrayed in a very understanding manner. They just didn't want to be steamrolled by an outside influence trying to bring in their religion and their culture. There's a moment where conversation is being had and they talk about how at this point in time, four different countries are trying to basically take over Japan. I can only imagine the frustrations. That's quite a skill as far as the filmmaking goes because mm -hmm. they straight up tortured and killed people. Mm -hmm. And we watched it and I'm sitting there watching it going like, this is actually pretty balanced, which yeah, seems like a very odd thing to say, but that was one of my takeaways. Going back to what I was saying just a little bit earlier about opportunities to see films that are made outside of the Western perspective, that's almost never the case. And we can kind of go down this rabbit hole about the remake of this film and the perspective that it takes. But whenever you see a film that focuses on religion and specifically Christianity, usually it seems, at least in my experience, that the individuals who follow that faith are set up as the heroes, the protagonists, the people on the right, whatever you want to call them. So it was really, really interesting and a happy surprise to see that not necessarily be the case in this film. I first saw the film, it might have been this year or it might have been last year. I first saw, of course, Martin Scorsese's version of it. And then there's something called the Criterion Channel. Yes. If people aren't familiar with it, it's a channel that emphasizes not just films that are in the Criterion Collection, but they'll also get other films as well that are more on the art side, foreign indie cinema. They do do pop culture as well. So when Silence showed up on the Criterion Channel, of course, I had to watch it. And I loved the film. Some of it is for the reasons you say. And maybe now we can get into a comparison of the Scorsese film. The Scorsese film has a lot of followers that think it is possibly Scorsese's masterpiece. Mm -hmm. But as I warned you, I have a very extreme views on this. Not only do I think Scorsese's film is probably one of his worst films, I think it's deeply, deeply offensive. One place to start as to what the big difference is, is how each film starts. Yeah. In Scorsese's film, it starts with these two priests. We're supposed to be Portuguese, but, you know, it's Andrew Garfield and... <laughs> Adam Driver. But, Milo you know. And then later on, we get to Liam Neeson, who right. I don't know what, yeah. Who has never been bothered <laughs> to work to on an accent try ever. an accent. <laughs> At the same time, I can say that the two actors who play the Portuguese in the Japanese film are great actors either. Sure. Scorsese's film starts out with these two people being given this assignment. They're supposed to find this person. How the Japanese film starts is with a prologue that says that the Catholic Church was losing power because of the Protestant Reformation. Because of that, they needed to find inroads in other countries. So they went to Japan. And at first they had a great success. And then the Japanese government started cracking down on them. And that's one of the major differences. Because for me, Martin Scorsese posits Catholicism and Christianity as this sort of benign spiritual system where you can achieve transcendence. And that's all it is. Mm -hmm. yeah. But in the Japanese film, it's not. It is a religion that is used to gain power. And the key scene is the debate scene. In the Scorsese version, it's between Andrew Garfield and I believe the name is Anui or Inoue. And at one point, Andrew Garfield says, I don't think you understand Christianity. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And my response was, it infuriated me. My response was, no, you don't understand Christianity. Exactly. This, this Japanese official, he understands it perfectly well. He knows that if he lets Christianity in, they are going to do to Japan what they've done to every other country that they've made inroads in. He's not stupid. He knows what's going on in the new world. England is going into India and China. France, England, and Germany are going into Africa. All I could think of is, yes, these people are being tortured by the Japanese government, and that's terrible. But the Catholic Church is the church of the Crusades. Yeah. Right. And the Inquisition. And they the certainly don't have horrible, clean hands. Right. Yeah, and the horrible crimes committed in conquering the New World. So if we're going to compare who is the worst person, I'm not going to say it's the Japanese, not when I know what I know about the Catholic church. And the other difference for me was that the Japanese version, I think, emphasizes the Japanese a lot more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What happens is they now become a persecuted minority. And I can get behind a persecuted minority. Yep. It may be that they're Catholics and I may have issues with Catholicism, but they're a persecuted minority. I can get behind them for that. 
in Scorsese's version, it's more about the priests. And my reaction was he took a book about a persecuted minority and made it all about himself. I agree with you. Yeah, 100%. Setting the table with, there's this Father Ferreira who mm -hmm. ostensibly has disappeared. We believe that he has renounced his faith and just seeing their astonishment that that couldn't possibly <laughs> be the case, we must go save him. Everything about the way the Scorsese film started shifted the perception on what the church was really about and what they were doing in a way that further down the road in the movie, now you can more easily view the Japanese as the enemy. Right. Or as in some ways almost less than human because they are doing these evil things and also because they don't follow this faith. So it sets the table for having such a deeply different take in all of these subtle ways. By the time you get to the end of the movie, I wonder, am I even watching the same film? Some of the lines were word for word right. the right. same. So it was just such a bizarre juxtaposition at times. Even at the very top of the Scorsese version, there is a line word for word where Garfield says, we need to save his soul. It becomes this, not to put too fine a point on it, but this holy mission that they are there to save the soul of this priest who has been forced to potentially renounce his faith, who is probably being tortured along with all of those that he's converted. It is a much different opening and there is a manipulation that's taking place and the 71 version, to your point, Howard, you talk about how the context is given of why those priests are there, what the church's aim is. It gives the audience an immediate sense of what is happening in this world right now. Whereas Scorsese very very deliberately does not give that information to us. And instead, what he focuses on is the individual, the two priests. They set it up as you're going to be in danger. Are you sure you want to do this? And they're so adamant. No, 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 we have to do this. He and, says they can't do it. He right. refuses to allow them to go at first. And, and they eventually, again, steamroll him into saying, fine. You can't do this. But, okay, you can do it. Right. So it is a markedly different opening to the two films. That is the power of filmmaking in terms of subtly altering the audience's perception of what is right and wrong, whose side we should be on. That's exactly what Scorsese does. As a filmmaker, he has the right, I suppose, to put whatever POV he wants on the film. But at the same time, if there's anything to be said for being respectful of the original material, both the book and the first film, he does a real disservice to what was originally portrayed. To me, it's um, this is a very strong dramatic word, but it's kind of an abomination of what preceded it. Everyone thinks of this movie as being Scorsese's movie. It's almost as right. though the 71 version right. doesn't exist. I actually feel fortunate that we watched the 71 version first. So mm -hmm. that's my first impression mm -hmm. of the story. Part of that is what makes these changes so apparent. As soon as we wrapped with watching the Scorsese version, Derek and I were both, well, <laughs> that certainly wasn't ambiguous as far as whose side we were supposed to be on. And again, yeah. that just falls right into what I was saying earlier about other kinds of films that I've seen of a similar nature where it involves religion and specifically Catholicism, Christianity, that kind of faith. The original and one of the reasons why you tend to feel more for the peasants, the Catholics there, is they're caught. They're caught between what was a terrible, terrible dictatorship in Japan at the time that treated them very badly and this Catholic church who claims to be their answer spiritually, but really just wants power. One of the things that neither movie does reveal, in both films they argue about the growth of Catholicism and the Japanese, the officer Anui says nobody wants it here but then the priest returns and says everybody wants it here because it's been growing and the only reason why it's not growing is because you're persecuting everybody what is not actually stated is one of the reasons why Catholicism was growing was not just because of its spiritual message but because they were supporting the south that was in rebellion against the Japanese government mm. so you come in with this religion that says not only is this the way to heaven but we're going to help you overthrow the government, you're going to get a lot of people who convert, but then they get caught mm -hmm. between two factions and they're the ones who truly suffer. Absolutely. Yeah. There was one other difference that I think it was actually a pretty major difference, but it was another one of those subtle things where I don't think in the 1971 version, Rodriguez ever actually hears or they never portray mm -hmm. him as hearing the voice of God, whereas no. Garfield's character hears this voice, which is actually the voice of the priest that they talked to at the beginning. It takes away this inner conflict that's happening within Rodriguez about how he values his faith versus the safety and well-being 
being of other people whose harm may be due to his behavior. God tells me, just step on it. Mm -hmm. Fine, I'll take a step. God just told me. It's literally a deus ex machina. <laughs> yeah, and I, I don't know why they did that. I do think that that's in the book, though I could be wrong. Is it really? Is it? I haven't okay. read the okay. book, but I've read about it. I think that may be in the book. But someone else has also pointed out, yeah, it's not in the 1971 version. So any decision he makes has to be his own decision. It's an interesting conflict for Christians. Is it okay to renounce your faith if you're going to save people's lives? Even beyond that, is it an actual renunciation if you're only doing it to save people's lives? Like one of those people that will say, I prefer the book. <laughs> but in this case, moving that over to a film, that internal narration where he's hearing the voice of God, I prefer the 71, but mm -hmm. I respect the book. Well, I was just going to say really quickly, you just mentioned the fact that at least in the 71 version, it is upon his shoulders and his shoulders only to make the decision eventually that he makes in renouncing his faith. He has agency, whereas in the Scorsese version, he is given this out. What more do you need to hear than when you think you hear the voice of God telling you that it's fine. To both of your points, completely deflates the internal conflict, the tension, and the responsibility that he takes to make this choice. If that's what's in the book, I'd be so curious to know how it's actually played out. You know, I'm always really just automatically trying to be respectful of source material. I didn't like the way that it came off in the Scorsese version. Another thing that it does is it introduces God as a character in the movie, where the 1971 version, it's a religious people practice it, they have faith, right. maybe it's real, maybe it's not. There are others that people also follow yeah. versus I'm right here and I'm right. God. It kind of skews the balance of how you might perceive both sets of characters' actions. Mm -hmm. Before moving on, we definitely have to mention the cinematography mm. by mm -hmm. Katsuo Miyagawa, who also did the cinematography for such great Japanese films as Rashomon, Yojimbo, and Ugetsu. The cinematography is absolutely ravishing. It feels so much like looking at paintings by Rembrandt and Rubens. So I just want to emphasize cinematography that I think is just astounding. And especially one scene that really, for a couple of reasons, took my breath away when they are performing the crucifixion fictions in the ocean. I understand, I think, why Scorsese decided to go with the much more in-your-face graphic version of it. But I do think that, for me at least, had more impact to have that long shot where you see them at a distance, you see them in low light, you know exactly what's happening. And I do think that, to your point, yes, that was very painterly and as awful as what was happening in that moment, it was a very beautiful scene for what it was. The other one that comes to mind for me is when again in the 71 version when Rodriguez is brought to the beach and he sees Garpe mm -hmm. his companion who at this point in the 71 version we didn't really know what had happened to him and we see him run out to try to save people that are being mm -hmm. thrown out of the boat and because you're viewing it from this distance it's like this mechanical movement the people on the boat are just getting tossed over I can't even really tell if they have spears or poles or what they're using to, to either drown them or stab them it's taking away not having to see any emotion on the part mm -hmm. of the people on the boat, it gave it this different weight to it. And mm -hmm. then in the Scorsese version, seeing him <laughs> run out to try to save the people, it's a more intimate where you're mm -hmm. actually seeing the people on the boat. It took away some of that power that the original had for me. Well, with that, here's a little bit more information about the film. Ashima Oishita, who played Kiku, who is the person who ends up being Rodrigo's wife, actually married to the director, who was his <laughs> second, oh. wife, second wife. Perhaps the most famous person from the movie is Mako, who who played Kichijiro. And mm. Kichijiro is the one who keeps going back and forth. <laughs> Does he ever? Well. Yes. And Mako in the U.S. is best known for his Oscar-nominated performance from The Sand Pebbles. He was also in Conan the Barbarian, Pearl Harbor, and a number of other films. He's one of the Japanese actors who made an impact in U.S. Huh. movies. Don't really know much about the cost of the movie or how much money it made. Records for foreign films are not easy to get mm -hmm. today. Is there anything else you might want to say about this film or or uh, the Blues Brothers or both films before we close out. I already have an internal bias, but I think that between the 71 version of this film and the Scorsese version, it for me reaffirms the bias that most of the time you should just leave an original alone because it was so beautifully crafted. And again, it comes from this place that it's sad on the one hand that we so rarely get to see a more balanced take on films that are focusing on religion. And this is one that does it really, really well. To be quite honest, I was really disappointed in the remake of it 
and in the choices made that just skew so heavily towards the Catholic Church. In that regard, I thank you for actually putting this on our radar. I would say that if you have the option to see either an original or a movie that may have been remade for the U.S., The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo is one that also comes to mind. They were kind of remade pretty shortly after the original international versions. I feel like I skew towards the international one because I get a better understanding of the movie that they were actually trying to make. Right. Instead of getting kind of a westernized version. I think it did do a disservice to Scorsese's version of Silence. It's not a terrible movie, but to the extent decisions were made to try to make it more popular, that didn't work because right. it did not do great. Yeah. I would have just wished for a more authentic version. So if you can find the more authentic and original version, just watch it. Do it. Like the Blues Brothers. <laughs> <laughs> Versus Blues Brothers 2000. <laughs> yeah. In closing out, I asked you to choose a film or two to go with your choice that might interest our audience. I have one for each of the two films. For me, as I mentioned, The Blues Brothers is this little bit of an ode to the city of Chicago. And you were saying so yourself, Howard, how exciting it was to have the film shown there at the time that it came out. I think another film that does that really well, that again is kind of part of that era, has the same comedic overtones, is Ferris Bueller's Day Off. That to me was a real obvious pick. You know, if somebody loves The Blues Brothers, they would also get a lot of enjoyment out of Ferris Bueller. Does very similar work in terms of really showcasing the city and making it another character in the film. And then it definitely doesn't have the kind of balanced take that I think the 71 Silence does. But if somebody is interested in films about the Catholic faith, what that world was like several centuries removed, The Mission is a oh, film. Oh, mine. Oh, sorry. I somehow <laughs> knew that's what you were leading up yeah, to. Yeah, <laughs> that might be a film that more people than I realize are already familiar with. That's a film that I've seen as well. And it took me back to that place a little bit too. That was going to be my pick for something similar and I think I thought of that when we first started watching the 71 version of Silence mm -hmm. was it reminded me conceptually of the mission. As far as the Blues Brothers goes, it's not exactly the same, but it gives me that same ridiculous sense. A movie with Chevy Chase and Dan Aykroyd called Spies Like Us. Mm -hmm. They're not really on a mission from God, but they are on a mission to save the world from nuclear war. Pretty big ask, so yeah. that's similar. <laughs> yeah, they cheated their way into the military, which I don't know if people would even do that. Why would you do that? But they do that. I don't want to give away any spoilers, but they're used as decoys and it turns out they actually saved the world. Spoilers! <laughs> <laughs> For me, I chose two films. The first is A Diary of a Country Priest. This mm -hmm. is the French director Robert Brisson's first feature film. Robert Brisson is one of my favorite directors of all time. It's a stunning character study of a new priest sent to a remote parish in the south of France, but finds it difficult to fulfill his spiritual duties to do the harsh locals who don't trust or like him and an ailment that makes him weak. For me, it's a bleak masterpiece of someone trying to find their spiritual self. The second is Priest, which was a controversial 1994 film directed by Antonia Bird about a priest who has a great calling but finds himself conflicted due to being gay and due to a confession given him by one of his parishioners revealing a crime that he can do nothing about. What is next? What should we be looking for from you? I guess on the podcast front, actually, and I swear this wasn't planned or intentional, but the next uh, episode that we're going to be having is about Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Wow, I can't <laughs> believe you did that. That'll be coming out next week. And then outside of that, I also am a writer and just had a short that was completed called She Had a Coming. We just found out last week that it got into its very first film festival. So Congratulations. Um, thank you very much. Which one? Uh, Which film festival? It's called Scene, and that's an acronym, S-E-N-E, -E, Film, Music, and Arts Festival. It's in Providence, Rhode Island. Essentially, it's a fall film festival in theory or in strange online. times. That's the thing is that they have made a point of saying they want this festival to be in person. So as of right now, they have not pushed their dates. It's scheduled for October 13th through the 17th, but they are very soon going to let us all know if that's actually going to hold or if they're just going to postpone it until it is a safer time in the world to, to actually hold it. Great. Anything to add, Derek? I will just probably get back to my day job and then... <laughs> uh... Look forward to doing our next episode. For me, I'll quickly go over my usual litany. I am a screenwriter and script consultant, so I have a Facebook page, Howard Kastner, screenwriting consultation. I have a blog called Rantings and Ravings, where I cover topics on movies and screenwriting. I publish two books of short stories, The Starving Artist and Other Stories, and The Five Corporations and One True Religion on Amazon. These are sci-fi, horror, and fantasy short stories. I have published the second edition of my screenwriting book, More Rantings and Ravings of 
a screenplay reader, and I'm an amateur photographer, and you can find those on Instagram. The previous podcast was with screenwriter Jordan Trapier, where we discussed Constantine and The Wailing, two films about demons. The next episode will feature a return of my very first podcast guest, screenwriter, filmmaker, and podcast.